I really don't need to do this, but uh, but I'm going to anyway. It's good to good to remember. And um, so we'll do a little uh, a little scriptural archaeology here, starting with Leviticus 19. And I want to thank Vanessa Avery for pointing me to some great uh, sources. On I know, this, this is way above my pay grade, um, but uh, the the word for stumbling block, later that becomes scandal on and later becomes scandal for us, begins with mikshal in this, uh, and uh, often cited in is this passage in Leviticus, you shall not curse the deaf nor place a stumbling block, mikshal, before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am your Lord. So um, uh, a couple things to say about this. This is uh, in the Midrashic tradition, you know, you can imagine these rabbis sitting around saying, why would anyone want to trip a blind person? Was this a problem? Were people going around doing this? Um, and then there are arguments, very interesting mimetic arguments made about that. Well, a blind person couldn't retaliate, you see. Uh, so uh, it became the Livne Iver lo sit and Michal became, I uh, apologize for my bad Hebrew, but Livne Iver became uh, a, a broad metaphorical injunction against giving corrupt advice against concealing one's motives or tempting another to sin. I would even say, uh, apropos of the last discussion and Lyle's question, it would even hold to um, uh, uh, making utilitarian use of sentiments for, for sort of non-relevant causes. Um, and uh, then, so um, uh, Vanessa pointed me to a great source on this, which pointed me to another source, Nahama Leibowitz. Um, because something we should bring out about scandal is it's not only an active thing, but a passive thing. That, that scandal, you can scandalize, but you can be scandalized, and they are equally s sinful. They're equally bad. So Leibowitz says here, the Torah teaches us that even by sitting at home doing nothing, by complete passivity and divorcement from society, one cannot shake off responsibility for what is transpiring in the world at large, for the iniquity, violence, and evil there. Uh, by not protesting, not marking the graves and danger spots, you have become responsible for any harm arising therefrom and have violated the prohibition, thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the, the blind, abbreviated if not there. So that's sort of where it gets started. Uh, I think we'll pass over St. Thomas, uh, but he says the same thing. Uh, 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 we'll just we'll just leave the summa aside for a moment, so that I can get through as much of this as I can as quickly as I can. Um, uh, so mikshal becomes the word translated into Koine Greek uh, as scandalon, which comes from skandalathron, which is the stick on which bait is put to lure an animal, which taking the bait springs the snare. And uh, interestingly, I only knew, knew this yesterday when I went back and was rereading things hidden or portions of it. And, um, and Gerard points out that it, the root is skazo, which is to limp. So the, 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 the victim is already coated on the stick, as it were, right? Um, and so famously, uh, you know, skandalon appears something like 29 times in the New Testament. No, just, no, just in the Gospels, more in, in the New Testament. It, it is a snare, a trap, a cause for moral stumbling, as in Matthew 16:23, and most one of the most famous uses, uses. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan." The Aramaic there, Satana, is the accuser. Get behind me, accuser. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but human things. A couple of notes to pull from that are, first of all, note the animal metaphor, particularly up here. The attraction is somehow connected to our lower impulses. It's, it's um, uh, pre-conscious, and of course we would say our mimetic nature. Also, as in Leviticus 19, uh, note the adjacency of a reference to some transcendent source of order and authority from which scandal is always luring us away. Right. In the same way that even in that political cartoon, the screen that had fallen was hiding uh, Grover Cleveland from Thomas Jefferson, right, uh, as this kind of luminary, uh, political saint, as it were. So then in, 
in uh, taking our school here a little further here, uh, in Hellenic Greek, um, there's some very interesting uses of this. The, uh, the verb skandalizo, to give offense, is, uh, is used just as often in the passive, mean, uh, to take offense. Uh, and then there's also a phrase, a kind of a, an idiomatic phrase uh, used uh, regularly, but it even predates uh, uh, Hellenic uh, literature. It's in Aristophanes. Skandalethi um, stas epon, which means setting word traps, right? Um, in a political context, today we, you know, they would call this gotcha questions. And the journalist is just trying to get the person to say the thing that will get them a lot, uh, in a lot of trouble when it becomes a viral issue, right? And then I'm very proud of myself. Uh, and spend way too. I'm a I'm an etymology geek, and uh, I spent a lot of time with the Liddell Scott Greek uh, uh, lexicon. And in some Delphic fragments, the word skandalistes is a trapeze artist. And I said, what the heck? And I don't know. I can't figure out. I don't. It, it's it, it's definitely not a happenstance connection. I, th I suggest it is perhaps by the similarity of the steak um, in a trap baited with meat to the stick of the trapeze that the gymnast hangs from. And, um, but also I think it gets at the way that the, the scandaliste is one who fascinates, who uh, uh, fascinates an audience with her, his or her ability to cheat death, right? Um, we were talking about circuses before. Uh, there's something intimately connected to this, right? Um, so f when we think of scandal, we should think of the, the passive and the active forms of scandal. We should think away the way it lures us away from something, not just to something, but away from something. And also that it, it involves this fascination. Uh, we get fastened onto it. For Girard, uh, scandal is always a, 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 an interference. It is a distraction. We were, again, I could tie that to the way, uh, to the, the question of attention spans that we were talking about a moment ago. So, um, on with this little uh, midrash. Uh, uh, scandal, uh, obviously important uh, in the, in the uh, Gospels in many ways. Th this other passage worth quoting. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. And Gerard points out that the millstone is a telling repetition of the stone, the stumbling block on the ground, but the millstone symbolically represents, it's a symbol of mindless, grinding, circular, animal repetition. You know, it's the ass that is turning the wheel on the grindstone. Um, and he points out in a passage right connected to that, that giving in to scandal is, is directly opposed to the process of opening up of welcoming others. It's about being in a closed loop, in other words. Uh, you know, that uh, the system of order that creates itself at the expense of a, of a victim. Um, the other little characteristic I want to sort of pull out of scandal is the way it is a double-edged sword, just as mimesis can be positive or negative, or very often it is negative, scandal, it would seem to ha have potential positive aspects to it. Uh, the, the way out of bad mimesis is through mimesis. It's to change your model, right? To, to a, to a non-rivalrous model. But the way out of scandal is also through scandal, I think. And, uh, I thought of that while rereading the, uh, Romans 9 particular, in particular, which begins with the line, uh, I am speaking truth in Christ. I am not lying. But then, uh, 30 verses later, uh, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of context, I hope you know it, but what are then we to say, Gentiles who did not strive for righteousness have attained it, that is righteousness through faith, but Israel did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Why not? They have stumbled over a scandal on, as it is written, and then, this is the perverse part, this is the paradoxical part, they have stumbled, stumbled over a scandal on, and he, he produces a kind of conflated quotation of two different 
uh, verses in Isaiah 8.14 and 28.16. See, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. There's the problematic of the Hebrew God just, you know, messing with people all the time. And, uh, but it's preserved heavily in the, in our religious tradition. Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. What? Right? I think that's a bad translation. Of all the things they changed with the New Roman Missal, they left that in place. Uh, I don't want to start on that. I, I get scandalized by the tra new translation, you know. Uh, chalices all, all over the place. Um, also quote, quoting here Jeremiah Alberg, who's, well, who's keen to this, uh, as you know, he's, he's the real expert on scandal. He should be here talking, not me. Um, scandal is the place where the battle between staying with the illusion or looking long and hard at reality is played out. Right? Uh, so sc scandal is bad, but scandal is an opportunity. Maybe if we've tripped the trap enough, we can learn from it and, and look away or move in some other direction. So um, <clears throat> now I didn't know what the audience was going to be, so I'm now going to explain mimetic theory to you. Uh, but I'm going to do it at lightning speed, just so I keep my slides in order, right? We know an individual, and, it, and there's some acquisitive uh, object of desire out there, but an individual uh, models uh, the desire on a model, on somebody else, right? This is the basic triangular aspect of it. And, of course, it is scandalous because, and here's way too much text to read, suddenly the model is transformed into an obstacle and combines two contradictory terms. He is at the same time the one who is adored, since he shows the subject what is desirable, and the one who is hated, since as rival he prohibits the possession of it. And when I teach advertising, I use, I use high heel shoes and shoppers and things like that. Uh, but you, you take the, 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 the individual, quote unquote, who thinks she wants these things because she's seen a successful prestigious uh, shopper who's achieved them, but that person is then uh, an obstacle at the same time. That's the scandal. Now, capitalism has its way of dealing with that, of course. It just makes more shoes, but then nobody wants them. So it's not really an answer, right? Um, the scandal also, in, just since I'm mentioning advertising, and this is one of the really in, important things in like my field in rhetoric and media studies, is it has this way to just completely up-earth these long-held understandings. In, in, in media and communication studies since the 60s, there's gaze theory, right, beginning with Laura Mulvey and the way that uh, the male gaze is always as, uh, a symbol of the appropriative power of the male and objectifying women. And yes, it has that, but it, 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 there's a kind of reductionism to it. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas the gaze understood through this mimetic understanding of scandal is, is a lot richer. It really problematizes that whole, uh, uh, the, the more narrow uh, identity politics, um, uh, uh, some, some feminist politicizations of gays theory. Um, you know, we can see it in advertising. The people we want to be like look like cyborgs who are going to assassinate us. <laughs> right? What? You know, this is, this is because advertising now, I mean, yes, advertising used to show us happy people who are successful that we should model ourselves on, now it shows us psychopaths, right? You know, really, in many cases. I'll, I'll, I, 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 I tried not to put Hitler in here because that just blows everything up, but um, it's also, in, it's also in, in lots and lots of, uh, of uh, Stalinist iconography, Maoist iconography. I also teach in, in propaganda theory. So, for Girard's scandal is then this mimetic, this reciprocal mimetic escalation that's generated by acquisitive mimesis through the interplay of attraction and repul attraction to and repulsion from uh, fascinating surfaces. That's that's uh, Jay's word. That, that's perfect. You can't improve on fascinating surface, uh, which induces a sameness. Right. The problem is is this sameness that's induced between the model and the disciple. So. Here's my little two-bit animation, right? The things that were different become the same and the object goes away. The object's not important anymore. We're objects for each other. 
if we're caught into this scandal. And that's the scandal. It's objectifying the other. It's not sympathizing or empathizing. It's not, uh, Smith, Adam Smith's word is having no fellow feeling, right? This is, this scandal is the recipe for abandoning fellow feeling. Um, so then, as we all know, uh, th this is contagious, and uh, you run into the sort of war of all against all, the Hobbesian uh, mimetic crisis, and uh, a little passage from things hidden here that seems apt also to our media environment uh, is Girard here. Uh, as the barriers between people start to disappear, mimetic antagonisms multiply. You know, we think that our media break down barriers. And, and in some ways they do, social media especially, in some ways they isolate, but they, they tend to escalate the, the, the possibility of mimetic antagonisms. A world with fewer and fewer fixed and institutionalized barriers will afford more and more opportunities for people to become fascinating obstacles for each other, for them to be a cause of reciprocal scandal for one another. And, and then it can be monetized, you see, in the media. Um, well, the mechanism works this way. At some moment, at some propitious moment, uh, someone is blamed, right, is accused. Uh, the, the hitherto uh, uh, con conflicted members of the, of the group are now united against one. The one is excluded or, or murdered or killed bringing about a kind of temporary sacrificial unity, right? And the victim is sacralized and, but then the object reappears <laughs> at some point. And, and this, is, this is like, I was shampooing my hair this morning, you read, you know, wet hair, lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, that's, that's mimetic theory or that's this aspect of it, right? So there's the need to create exculpatory myths uh, uh, drum, uh, rituals, which is the dramaturgy for reproducing the effect, you know, um, as needed, as the, as the druggist said. Um, and then systems of pro prohibition, which are other rules for sustaining order. So now we go to, I'm going to talk about fake news in a few, in a few minutes. But, um, uh, in, in, in our contemporary media environment, uh, although in advertising there is a acquisitive desire operating on, on objects. Um, in the political environment, the object is, is narrative control. Right? Who controls the narrative? Um, just as the, uh, but interestingly, <laughs> just as the object of acquisitive rivalry disappears as the rivalry scandalously escalates, so does the ontological significance of narrative. The more you fight over who's controlling the narrative, the less the content of the narrative matters at all. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't matter. This is getting us to our post-truth moment. Who needs truth when the, when the content or the meaning of the narrative is beside the point? The, the rivalry is the point. Uh, uh, obsessive rivalry is symptomatic of an urge, I'm saying here, to expunge all competing narrative meanings to the point of emptying out the meaning of meaning. And that's, that's uh, I'm not trying to politicize this all, but it's a, it's a fairly obvious example that we've experienced. Um, and what's really, uh, I suppose, canny uh, is the naming, the need to put, put a, 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 a fixed label on all of the opponents, right? Except for one, uh, Putin doesn't get a name. <laughs> Right, he, he who shall not be named, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, and of course then, then of course, a, a big rival is the media itself. So why not call it fake news? It's all fake news. Uh, that's a way of just sort of putting the question of, of narrative, of story, having any value whatsoever off the table uh, and, and out of the picture. It's scapegoating truth might be a way of putting it. So I know a little phrase, a little thing I want to introduce just before we get to uh, my my points on fake news, is that uh, is the distinction between lying and bullshit. It's very important, and uh, and um, uh, the liar is somebody who admits the truth, quote unquote. You have to admit it. You have to admit that there is a truth, and in fact that you care about it enough to sin against it, right? Uh, 
the, a lie is, uh, says, uh, um, says Harry Frankfurt, Princeton philosopher, uh, said a lie is always paying a backhanded compliment to the truth. And of course, literature, uh, great literature, leads us to this all the time, nowhere more explicitly than in Crime and Punishment. Porfiry Petrovich, the chief investigator, uh, inve uh, looking at the murder, is uh, dealing with one of his uh, lieutenants who's complaining, I can't figure this out, everybody's lying. We know Raskol Raskolnikov is guilty, but, but everybody's just lying. And, and uh, uh, Petrovich says, well, what's the most, what most offensive is not they're lying. One can always forgive lying. Lying is a wonderful thing. It always gets you closer to the truth. What is offensive is that they lie and worship their own lying. Right? When they begin to worship their lying, they're scapegoating truth. And, and then they're not really lying anymore in a certain way. Because you can't lie if there's no truth around. Right? Um, what they're doing is bullshitting. And Harry Frankfurt, who's written this terrific little book, and I do mean a little book, it's really just an essay, called On Bullshit, um, which you can download a PDF of. It's very, uh, it, it's very interesting. The bullshitter simply hasn't any regard for the truth. He's not lying. Just the, the truth is, is not relevant. It's not even in the same field. So that's an important kind of distinction to keep in mind, particularly when we talk about fake news. So, I'm going to talk about f what I'm calling four moments in fake news. How am I doing on time? I don't, yeah? Okay, good. Okay, good. So, four moments in fake news. The phrase fake news uh, was first used by uh, John Stewart, the, the TV satirist, right? Um, he called the Daily Show fake, fake news show and asked by an interviewer, uh, uh, Terry Gross, actually, um, in an interview on NPR, Fresh Air, he asked, why do you call it fake news? And Stewart says, well, for me, it was just an exciting, it was just exciting to see fake news catching on. I think we don't make things up. We just distill it to, hopefully, its most humorous nugget. And in that sense, it seems fake and skewed just because we don't have to be subjective or pretend to be objective. That'll come up in my number four, right? We can just put it out there. So uh, I had a little video to play, but there's no, there's no audio here. But there's a great little moment. Back in 2004, the Bush, administrated, Bush administration started putting out video news releases. That They hired an actor to play a reporter to go around and ask people about health care. And then uh, through their public relations, uh, this uh, thing called the Lincoln Group, a little spooky uh, group uh, distributed to television stations who always need content and just put it on the air as if it were news. So that was fake news. And uh, but the greatest thing is, uh, Stewart had uh, Rob Corddry, the senior media ethicist, <laughs> uh, being interviewed on Capitol Hill, complaining that the fake, the real fake news, was outdoing them. <laughs> so this scandalous rivalry, and he, you know, you can see he's just crestfallen. You know, we, we branded fake news, we do fake news best, and now the Bush administration has come out and they're actually doing actual fake news, yeah. So, you'll have to take my word for it, it's very funny. Uh, it's really one of the more hilarious uh, skits. One of the things to get at about satire is that satire, through its main discursive modes, irony, burlesque, Hyperbole, it's very, uh, rhetoricians say it's very tropic or tropical, you could say. Um, by always uh, using irony, which is to say, say one thing and somehow signal that you mean the opposite, right? You're always uh, invigorating language, be, be, a language as an interplay of non determinant differential meanings. You know, language is not a labeling system, right? As, as maybe Trump would have it in. Naming Rocket Man and Little Marco and all these things. So, um, so satire is then the opposite and the antidote to propaganda. Right? And, 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 it's, and in the play of imagination that it's required there. And, and I would say that that extends to literature as well. Right? Um, to great literature. So that, there's phase one. Phase two then is this kind of reanimated moment of fake news just fairly recently, which is the, the 
fictional viral clickbait kind, you know, Macedonian teenagers setting up phony websites that look like news sites and then creating content designed to scandalize. Like this famous example is Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump for Trump for president, right? A releases statement, and then it went viral for a while until it shut down. So, uh, so this is the second moment. This kind of recognition by these by these uh, web entrepreneurs that they could monetize scandal through through a real fake news. Um, and also, it, it, this particular example seems to have a, a, a canny intuition about it, an implication by a purely capitalistic economic actor somewhere in Macedonia of a crisis of difference between a po political and religious realms, right? These things that have lost their footing in, an, in a non-truth age. What, what, what's the difference between a religious truth, a political truth, a spiritual truth, a cult? It doesn't matter. Right? You just find you just find one at one end of the pole and the other, and you pair them together, and you say, "Oh, they're the same." Right? And in some ways, they may be, but uh, not for the most part. So that's the second moment. The third moment, though, is the reappropriation. Here, most famously, by our commander in chief, um, where fake news becomes an accusation. Right? It the, the the phrase itself is turned into a label. To scapegoat with it is scapegoating, and it's the move of propaganda. Uh, my theory on propaganda is that it operates as a kind of um, pseudo language. It it pretends to be signifying through differences, and it invites you in on that basis. But then, as soon as you get there, it closes that down and says, "We we weren't kidding. Those weren't metaphors. Right? Jews are vermin. Right? <laughs> it's not a metaphor." Um, so. Uh, yeah, here we have Donald Trump, the fake news media failing at New York Times, at NBC News, at ABC, at CBS, at CNN, is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the, of the American people. Right? And a little quote from, a, uh, from an essay I just found by Rene Girard, scapegoating becomes more and more effective as there is less and less knowledge, or we might say more and more bullshit, right? Because in a world of bullshit, uh, the uh, scapegoats are numberless. Right? Everyone and anyone can become. Right? Anyone who has a story to tell. Uh, you know, uh, so scapegoating becomes more and more effective as there is less and less knowledge, less awareness of it as a collective delusion. Right? Right? That's where we are. And I thought I was going to stop there. I thought, well, that's it. I've said my piece on fake news. And then I realized, no, there's a fourth fake news. Because the joke's on us. <laughs> the joke's on us. Um, real news is fake news. A vast majority of commercial, commercially real news is, in many ways, fake. Right? Um, it has this kind of ontological hubris. We're watching the news. We're, we're being given the world. right? Uh, and, uh, of course, even a fairly naive... Uh, someone who naively understands language knows that can't be true, right? I have one of my favorite quotes from Kenneth Burke in an essay on terministic screens. He says, even if a given terminology is a reflection of reality, by its very nature as a terminology, it must be a selection of reality, and to this extent must function also as a deflection of reality a scapegoating of some reality at the expense of a narrative that we want to tell. And we have to recognize that just as mimetic models on, a, on an interpersonal basis mediate ourselves to ourselves, um, the media, as we commonly call them, are in a sense meta-models. They supply models and they also supply a way of modeling. Right? Everyone now, especially with social media, everybody's a journalist, right? Um, either through retweeting or putting up their, uh, their, you know, grinding their axes or whatever. So as organizations and technologies, it's true. The vast majority of the commercial media are, are mythic um, through and through. Commercial and ideological, uh, ideological complicity 
especially through consumer capitalism, which is in every sense a sacrificial religion in an archaic sense, um, is the very source of so much scandal that becomes news fodder. You know, it's enough to make your head spin. And that's the idea, actually. If your head spins, so much the better. That kind of explains a lot of the post-2016 bewilderment. Um, so my point is that for much of the media, scandal is their game. It is the game. Uh, partly because where scandal crudesces, uh, where it comes up and we see it, uh, we are fascinated. We're drawn to it. And, and we're drawn to it, why? Because where, where scandal is, we are alerted to the presence of scapegoating. See scandal? There's scapegoating. You're going, the mechanism is operating in your neighborhood, in your vicinity. And that means that each of us will have a role to play. Right? When you're near the mechanism, when you're caught into it. Um, and the question is, do we, do we scandalize? Do we allow ourselves to be scandalized? Um, or do we do the really scandalous thing, which is to opt for other non-rivalrous models? Okay, that's everything I know about fake news. Um, so I thought we would talk for a few, well, you can ask questions, or we tried to make this a workshop, and I didn't really know what that was. <laughs> Since I'm a sort of a lecturer by uh, by habit, but... Uh, I brought some little case sheets about a recent and very wide, widely known scandal, the Colin Kaepernick scandal, uh, the NFL thing. And uh, so here's a little fact sheet. You may not need it because if you're if you're attuned to the media, you know all you know more about it than you want to, probably. So anyway, we thought since everybody's People could talk about this amongst yourselves for a moment, and then, and then uh, perhaps come back. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Ten. Yeah. You have about ten more minutes. Okay. Sounds good. Yes, yeah, so I put a couple images up here. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you can see this image up here, but uh, one of the memes that that went very viral in social media after this was this image of a Marine uh, who lost both his legs in, uh, in uh, either Iraq or Afghanistan, I think. But here he is standing in his dress uniform at an NBA game for the national anthem. So it became a kind of a battle of competing victims. Right. And how dare you appropriate our victims? How, you know, um, you know we, we can't we can't talk about our military dead. It's fine to talk about uh, Michael Brown. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to discuss that or. Not in the way he means. Not in the way he means. Uh, there's something... Well, uh, yeah, I think maybe that's right. Um, I, I think that we have to be just really on the alert, on the alert when we feel scandalized. And, and I don't know, I, I've been... Um, uh, unfortunately, since this presidency, I sort of started using my Twitter account again, and um, and I, I check it, you know.
was a reframing of the action in a way that would be the most scandalous. So, yeah. and that's the thing mm-hmm. that the our bullshitter in chief is is uh, skilled at beyond belief. I don't. I don't. I agree with you in many ways. I don't think it's a kind of a skill. It's more of a. Uh, um, a bullshit in the China it's shop? It's a knack. Well, you know, uh, I, here I go in my, I uh, have some classics training. In, in um, ancient Greece, uh, well, if you know the dialogues of uh, the Gorgias, where um, Socrates, the ultimate philosopher, is arguing with these sophists about what they do. And what they do is just try to win over a crowd at any expense. Whoever can be the most dinotes, the most clever, Right? And it doesn't matter if you contradict yourself. Right? And, and Socrates, you know, he said, well, you don't know what you're doing, so you're dangerous. Um, he said what they did was not a, not a true art, not a techne, not a skill. He, he, the word in Greek is not really translatable. He said it's a tribe, tribe which uh, it's often translated as a knack. I like the Yiddish word shtick. Right, you know, uh, so um, so I, that I would say that is maybe a little way to to to, to nuance your, your point, but also that if if you're living in the world of bullshit, it, it's not about reframing. You know, there are people like George Lakoff who very skillfully talk about reframing political arguments, but that's based on an abs- you know a very sophisticated understanding of language and metaphor. I mean, he's the god of metaphor studies, right? Um, and uh, so you're you're reframing it if you are conscientiously changing the metaphors while acknowledging that they are metaphors, uh, giving you access to the possibility that you're not trapped in a metaphor. In fact, the very nation, nature of a metaphor is that you can think around it. You know, so that's what I call reframing. This is something different. I don't have a name for it. It's slinging bullshitter. You know. Uh, if we have time for one more yeah. comment. Yeah, sure. um, I sort of see Donald Trump as a victim um, in this sense that, you know, just as our diet is very toxic and it comes out in the skin as a pimple, uh, I kind of see Donald Trump more as an icon, a result of a very toxic culture. Oh, he's a and, symptom, and, not, a, not, a, not the cause, yeah. Uh, and I get caught up in the whirlpool of his pre-adolescent behavior um, and what happens is I take my shadow side and rather with dealing with it internally, I project it onto him. Sure. Um, it brings out the worst. All of the energy of working for a toxic culture is spent on the drama of this ludicrous, silly behavior. Yes. No, ultimately, he's a child of God. What do you do with that one? I don't know. <laughs> uh. Yes, there, right, correct. And last, and then. Mm. Trump said that it's um, fake news is an uh, enemy of our democracy, right? Because it, you can't have an informed citizenry if you can't believe anything you hear, which is kind of where we're at. And um, and she um, she and she gave examples of all kinds of political slogans that really, when you look at it, you didn't know what they meant. And it and it, that's the way cam- campaigns go. So I did an inventory of the slogans for the last few years, and I really didn't know what any of them meant. You know, some of them had a little bit more zing, <laughs> right. but they really were empty words, right? And and she said this this is really dangerous. You know, and she of course she's extreme, right, and um, wanted to call journalists uh, to account so that they'd actually have to be hauled into court if they, um, if they told a mistruth, right, in print, because it would be so uh, injurious, you know, to, um, to a democracy. And, um, but she said the remedy for it would be this constant striving. You can't, you can't escape your own perspective stylism. Um, and, and, and in the nitty-gritty of a short journalistic piece, you're going to leave some things out, right? Um, but she said you still have to strive very hard for truth, 
And one way that you can do it is to avoid bloated language, right? So that you should constantly mm. qualify what you say. Right. So this is true to the extent that this yeah. is the case. Mm. You know, to, to be constantly, and, and, and that actually is clearer, right? If you say this is true to the extent that this is true, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I don't know, it takes more thinking than most people yeah. want to do. <laughs> yeah. A great book on a similar topic uh, is by... A, German guy named, or maybe he's Dutch, Uwe Perksen, a book called Plastic Words. I'll just leave you that one. I highly recommend it. Um, but I'm, my time is done, and it's time for Vanessa. <laughs>